Oh, yeah, perfect, perfect. <laughs> what, so, what is uh, going on with your camera? It's like you're on a boat. Okay, stop. What are you doing? <laughs> I would love to, and I have to give you credit where it's due. You're, you're one of the best interviews I've talked to. One of the best interviewers I've been blessed to talk to in ages, and it just made it fun for me. So I want to thank you very much for that. That's just giving me goose pimples. The goose I was like shivers. That's such a, an amazing compliment. Thank you so much, Robin. If ever you need a sidekick for your events, I'll be there for you. And we've got it on live on radio. He will not sue me for this. It's not a copy of the 5 a.m. club. It's not in my nature and I'm not a lawyer anymore. So. Oh yeah, I'm dealing with an ex-lawyer. I've got to be really careful. Okay. So my next guest, all I can say is If you haven't read any of these books, you have definitely heard of them. The 5 a.m. Club, does that ring a bell? The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari, one of my favorites. I'm talking about the one and only Robin Sharma. And he's here with me right now. Robin, welcome to the show. Thank you, Punam. Great to be with you. Now, I contacted your team during the pandemic. I don't know if it was a year and a half ago. And I said, would Robin like to come on the show? And they said, He's in hibernation or wherever you are and you write your books in that quiet space of yours. And um, he's writing his new novel. And now, a year and a half later, I have the book in my hands. And Robin, you signed it. You said, be great. I'm doing my best. Thank you so much for the book. So I want to know, was it the pandemic that triggered this book and the quietness that was going on around the world? What was it that inspired you? Yeah, it's a great question, Poonam. Um, I actually finished the first draft of the Everyday Hero Manifesto one month before the pandemic struck. Uh, I finished the first draft in Tribeca, New York, and um, then the world completely changed. But I think the book is very relevant for the world we live in right now. I've never seen, I don't know about you, but I've never seen so much volatility. Yeah. And so many of us are waiting for great heroes. We're waiting for the Mandalas. We're waiting for the Mother Teresas. We're waiting for the MLKs. And w- one of the key messages in the book is we all have heroism inside of us. Mm-hmm. And we might not need to be famous, but we all have bravery inside of us. We all have wisdom inside of us. We all have creativity inside of us. So why wait for those heroes to show up when if you use the methods I share in the Everyday Hero Manifesto, you can live a much more heroic life. And it's true because you're talking about celebrities. I mean, you know, you're around a lot of them when you're talking to them. I'm interviewing them and they're just everyday normal people with the same issues that we all have, maybe magnitude because they're in the limelight. And I remember when I was younger, you know, I used to go look up to Prince. I'd look up to all these people. And as you get older, you realize those everyday heroes really were your parents and your teachers and and your friends and your aunties and your uncles. Who were some of your heroes when you were growing up that have made you who you are today? Well, I first of all, I want to I want to salute you for for that beautiful statement. Um, it really speaks to me. And you're right. Sometimes you meet these celebrities, and it makes me think of the the phrase "everyone seems normal until you get to know them." Yeah. And so and so you're right. Uh, sometimes be careful about meeting your heroes. But for me, similar to you, my my father is a huge inspiration in my life. He was a family physician for 54 years incredibly wise, incredibly humble. My mother was a teacher for many years, so she's a great hero in my life. Um, And I say my readers from around the world, uh, you know, these are people who are willing to let go of their past selves for the sake of some for their best selves. And that takes a lot of bravery and courage. You know, I think we we must be willing to, to allow yesterday's part of us to experience a crucifixion so our best part can experience a resurrection so i'm really honored by my readers who read my books you know these are brave people they want to make the world a better place they want to be more productive in this age of dramatic distraction and then in the book i talked about cora greenway my grade five history teacher who saw something in me when not a lot of people saw much in me I read that bit. I read that bit. Yeah. And and you and it's always as you get older, you look back at all those people that might have said that one thing to you. And, you know, you coming, uh, you know, talking about your parents coming from, you know, an Indian upbringing as well. Me, myself, um, for me in the culture, and especially as a woman, whatever culture you're coming from, you know, there's a box to ticks. There's an age to have children and get married and everything. And I'm so out of the box, Robin. And when I look back, uh, the things that I've done have been so brave because I followed my heart and passion and I salute you too because you really just left law and 
without a whim went to write a book and you didn't even know how to publish it. I read that whole story. When you look back at that, was that your intuition guiding you, your passion? What was it? Absolutely. I think instinct is intellect. Mm. And a lot of us would get trapped into intellectualizing everything. Oh, I want to do this, but it doesn't make sense. Ah. And I think, you know, a lot of the Everyday Hero Manifesto is about trusting your instinct and your intuition and becoming a possibilitarian. Mm. So, yes, uh, you know, I was a litigation lawyer. I was, I did it for the wrong reasons. And I ended up being very unfulfilled, even though I was successful in the world. But what's the point of being successful and losing your soul in the process. Absolutely. And so I self-published this little, right? So I self-published this little book called The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. And I, and I have to say, I, really, I loved, I loved, I love this book. I love it. It's my favorite. Well, you're, you're so kind. <laughs> and, and, you know, I followed my intuition, but I really didn't have a choice. Like people go, I, oh, you were brave. To no, no, no. But you, you see, that's what I love. When you say you didn't have a choice, it's because your soul was calling you and you listened to it. A lot of people don't listen to it. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, you, very true. You know, it's very easy to say we have a choice, but you know, I know so many artists who go, "I want to do this, but I need to pay the bills," and, and I get that reality too. It takes bravery and an everyday hero to do what you did. You know. Well, I I would rather fail in the world than succeed at living my own mission. Yeah, you know? I, I, I I interviewed somebody yesterday, and they met you, and they said. One of the things that they always remember that you told them at this event was um, make your I cans bigger than your I can'ts. And when he said that, I I had this vision of I can in really big letters and it made me feel really powerful. I mean, do you still live by that? Yes, I, I think. I think in so many ways, you know, we're born into genius and then too many of us have been resigned into mediocrity. When we're little kids, it is about I can. I can become an astronaut. I can become a movement maker. I can become a baker. I can fall in love. I can run a marathon. And then the world seduces us with doubts and fears and all these things that cause us to restrict ourselves and to limit ourselves Mm -hmm. and we receive this programming and this hypnosis that we must be average and that the geniuses and the great artists and the movement makers are somehow cut from a different cloth and the everyday hero manifesto is really an instruction manual to help people live their heroism and break free of limitation and and live a, a great life there's one thing you put in your book and it's about journaling And you say journaling is prayer on paper and every prayer is heard. Do you journal every day? And do you have any great tips for us when it comes to journaling? I journal almost every day. Mm -hmm. I'm here in South Africa as I do this interview with you. I think I've taken two days off journaling because I just want to take a break from things. But journaling has inspired my life. Journaling has saved my life. When I've been in the valley of darkness, facing trial and, and tragedy, I poured my pain onto the paper and it was a great way to process through the pain so I didn't suppress it and carry it into the future with me. Mm -hmm. Uh, And in the good times of my life, I write about what I'm grateful for and the man I wish to become and the things I'm learning from taxi drivers or people that I meet. And journaling is also prayer on paper. You, You write about where you want to be in your future and it cements it into your subconscious mind and it clarifies it in your in your consciousness. You see, when you talk about that, there's, there feels like there's a lot of spirituality there because there's a lot of awareness of being grateful as well. Um, have you always had a sense of spirituality? Because even as a lawyer, you have to have a very logical mind too. Has that always been there? Is that something that's grown as you've become more aware and followed your soul's purpose? It's a great question. I think I've always been an artist. And I think I've always been very sensitive. You know, I remember being a kid and watching these movies and they just touched me, touched me so deeply. Yeah. And I do have the, the logical part, but I also, you know, I, I love, I love the breezes, you know, and I love conversations with fascinating people. And I, I just love the seasons of nature. I think my spirituality has, has emerged over the past years as I've continued to work with, work on myself I think you know the new book as well as just the way I live my life I think I'm very much in the world I try to be very productive I try to add great value to people but also I 
it's that old spiritual idea. I try to be in the world, but not of the world. So, but I, get I, try, that, right? I, I get it as I get older, though. I didn't get it when I was younger. Yes. No? Well, well, there's a chapter at the end of the Everyday Hero Manifesto, which is all about death as a hotel room upgrade. And oh, what I, I like, mean by that is, I like that. Well, we're, go- we're going through life. We're in a three star hotel. So many of us are afraid of death. I think when we die, we go up, we get upgraded to a five star hotel. And I think once we connect with our mortality and we realize even the longest life is a short ride, then we have this call it a spirituality where we take more risks, we're kinder to people, we live our truths, and we don't care so much about what other people think. Yeah, no, when you face your immortality, and I think that also comes to terms when you lose somebody in your life. Like when I lost somebody very close to me, it it shifted every perception and every priority. And sometimes you have to go through it to actually understand how to appreciate and what to put first and to realize you're not here to make money. You're here to contribute. And your legacy could be your books. It could be your children. It could be your music, your business. It doesn't have to be exactly the same as everybody else. And, and what if, I mean, there's, there's another chapter near the end, which is forget about legacy oh. and put them. I used to, I used to, I used to love the idea of legacy. I wrote a book on it called who will cry when you die. But do, like, you, do, you, think that's you know, a man, whole, do you think that's a male thing? I always hear men going, what will be my legacy? I don't hear it with women. Well, here, here's something to, to play with. Mm-hmm. Our legacy is how we will be remembered when we're no longer here, but we will no longer be here. So why does it remember? Why does it matter? Let us live. Let us be kind. Let us be excellent. Let us take brave risks. Let us make the world better while we are alive. So I think legacy in many ways is all about ego, how we'll be remembered. And I don't think it I don't think it really matters as much as so much of our culture says it should matter. No, I, I completely agree with you. I think social media has uplifted everyone's ego too with the amount of followers you have and everything and how, you know, popular sure. you are. It, it's magnified it so much. Um, there's, I'm going to pick a few things from the, from the book as well. You said, um, I love this chapter, 40 things I wish I knew before I was 40. Now, I I wish I knew this, but I don't know if you can figure it out in your 20s and 30s. Your choice of relationships is very important. Tell me about that. Oh, well, you know, know I'm speaking truth there. I know. Speak truth. Someone once said to me, all relationships are reasons, seasons, or lifetimes. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. some people come into our life for a reason. Some people come into our life for a season and those few, some some few people are in our life for a lifetime you, but i do you believe come in, that, you've come into mine for 20 minutes <laughs> or half an hour okay so there <laughs> so there must be a reason there must be a reason but i i think you know often we we are attracted to people for the wrong reasons uh, there's a chapter in the everyday hero manifesto a red flag is a red flag but we want to see people as we hope they are often especially in intimate relationships mm-hmm. and all too often we forget that a red flag is a red flag now having said that i've been in relationships that didn't work out and i must say they were the greatest father fodder for my artistic growth my creative growth and my spiritual growth i was once on an airplane uh, to paris and an artist sat next to me and he said, you know what? I pick relationship partners that break my heart. Wow. And I said, I said, why? And he goes, because when I'm suffering, I do my best paintings. I so I think, you know, no one should pick diff- difficulty, but if a relationship falls apart and we're suffering or heartbroken, I think there's a, a huge opportunity for learning and growth. Mm-hmm. And, and we do do a lot of our greatest artistic growth when, when we're in a hard time. You also mentioned, um, I don't believe you should always be positive about everything. And I love that because I totally agree with you because it is about feeling when you're down, feeling when you're sad, not covering it with the whole positivity vibe. Explain that a little bit more. It's a huge point. Um, there, there's such to- toxic optimism out there. You know, it's like, oh, you're going through a heartbreak or you've lost a loved one, going through a bankruptcy. Look for the good and smile. Now, There's nothing wrong with looking for the good, but if your heart is broken, we must honor the pain until we work through it. If you've lost a loved one, then feel the the grief because that's a human emotion. And over time, it will pass and release versus get repressed. And then 
once we've released the toxic, the, the difficult emotions, then it's the time for look at the lessons, focus on a brighter future and that kind of thing. But I think if you're hurting, honor the hurting versus fake it and pretend you're positive. I like that. Honor the hurt. I agree with you on that. Um, how has writing this book and coming on the other end changed you? Well, it was the most difficult book I've ever written. 5 a.m., the 5 a.m. club was, it took me four years. That was difficult. But the Everyday Hero Manifesto, uh, probably I probably write, wrote it 21 or 22 different times, 22 different versions. I I wanted every line perfect. I wanted every phrase perfect. I've shared so much of myself in this book, like that chapter, that time, 10 years of my journals disappeared. So it's a very vulnerable book. I know, book, I know, I remember right? that. Oof. Yeah, it's, it's, so it's a vulnerable book. It changed me because, because I went so deep and I worked so hard on it. So even if people don't read it, as an artist, it's made me a much better artist. And, and also what I did was, you know, I've had this mentoring curriculum that I've taught to billionaires and sports stars and entertainment people for 20 years. And I've taken a lot of that methodology and I've put it in the 350 pages of the book. And, um, you know, I've never done anything like that before. So. So, so as an author, you've just, you know, you finished this book, it's out there, we're talking about it, we're promoting it. In your mind, is the next book there or are you writing on it? Or do you think I have to have another one coming out soon? I don't. I don't. Then there's a there's a concept I believe in, which is it's it's better to do one masterwork than a thousand mediocrities. Mm. And I'd rather, you know, you look at the great artists, for example, Mike Michelangelo is one of my heroes, but he spent four years handcrafting the chapel, the ceiling in the Sistine Chapel. Yeah. And so I, you know, I worked really hard on this book, as I've suggested. I'm I'm sort of spent creatively. Honestly, I don't I don't have a lot of ideas for new books right now. I'm very empty. And that just means it's a season where I should recover and rest and take long walks and, you know, maybe eat more pizza than I usually eat and, and, and just enjoy this rest season until intuitively I'm ready to write another book. So I think Robin's next book is something to do with eat, pray and love because the way you're eating your pizza. I think it's been done. <laughs> I think that's been done. I could be wrong. No, it has been done, Elizabeth Guild. But so, um, I, you know your book, uh, The 5 a.m. Uh, Club? Um, everyone's read it that I know. I haven't read it, Robin. And, and the reason is, is because um, I used to do the breakfast show in England for the BBC years ago. And for years, I had to get up at 5 a.m. in the morning. Never, ever, ever did my body get used to it. So would you write The 8 a.m. Club? I would buy that in a heartbeat. <laughs> I think I, I think Poonam, you have to write the 8 a.m. Okay. That's your book. That, that's gonna speak to your that you gotta write from your authenticity. Come on, that's your book, not mine. Robin, if I write that, you won't sue me because you've given me that idea, will you? <laughs> no, of course not. Just give me, you know, uh, just throw a little roy. Yeah, that's I'll, fine. I'll, I'll give you a chapter in the book and you can tell me why you shouldn't be getting up at 8 a.m. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. <laughs> okay. So listen, um, what tips can you give us all when you get up in the morning and when you go to bed at night, just to start your day, you know, like a, you know, like a book, what do they call it? Not the, the book covers from on a bookshelf it's from beginning to end. So that day is good. Give me some tips from you. Is there meditation? Is there prayer? Are there walks? Or does it depend where you are? Well, the first thing is there's great quietude between four and six in the morning. I think there's a reason the great sages and saints and seers got up at that time. You, you've slept, you've released the residue of the day before, you're fresh. That's why prayer is so powerful at 5 a.m. That's why reading the heroic books or religious books or books of wisdom affect us and influence us so much more at that time of the day. It's, it's, so what I would say is University College London has told us 66 days of practicing a new habit, it becomes automatic. So give yourself 66 days of getting up at 5 a.m. because all change is hard at first, messy in the middle, gorgeous at the end. And then what do you do from five to six? Yes, you can exercise, which is which is an absolute game changer. It's so simple, but just like sweating. So you release BDNF and the, reduce the cortisol and dopamine. Prayer is so important to me. 
Mm-hmm. Every prayer is heard. Uh, writing in a journal, I've mentioned, very valuable to set the tone for the day ahead. Uh, reading is, it just locks you into your values or you get inspired or it just reminds you of the truths of what are most important. And then something as simple as music or, or solitude and silence. And you just start your day on that tone. And then the rest of your day unfolds very differently and much better. You know, they also say, you know, what you feed your body is important, the same way as you feed your mind. Are you, in, are you particular with the way you eat and the things that you watch, for example, on TV or in the documentaries and things like that? Yes, there, there's a chapter in the Everyday Hero Manifesto called the IPOP principle, input positivity, output positivity. Mm. I think it's a really important point. If, if, we're, if we're inputting and allowing toxic influencers into our mindset and heart set, if we're reading trashy novels or if we're around people who are just speaking to the worst of humanity versus the best, if we're in places that don't inspire us, all those things affect our inner ecosystem. That affects our productivity, it affects our happiness, and it affects our health. So yes, I'm very careful. Like I've deleted the energy vampires from my life. I don't have a lot of dream stealers in my orbit because I think you can change the world or be around toxic people. You can't do both. And in terms of diet, you know, I give myself a cheap meal once or twice a week, but I try to eat very clean. I try to drink good teas. I try to, um, I fast, I fast a lot, which it works really, really well for me. I wish I could. I just love food. I don't know what to do about that. Okay. I'll talk about that in the 8am book. Don't worry. (laughs) Well, you're going to, you'll, if you fast, you're going to save on your grocery bills too, I find. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right about that. I just need to eat. I am like a cow, uh, Robin. I gra- I graze every two hours just to keep my energy going, especially mentally on the radio. You need that energy for three hours. Sure. Yeah, I hear you. Huh? You hear me? So listen, I'm going to I'm going to graze shortly because we're, we're going to finish the show shortly. But, um, you know, you say you coach a lot of well-known people, billionaires. Why do they come for you? Because we, we look at them and think oh, they're set. They're content. They're made. What is it they're looking for from you? There's a lot of people who have a lot of money, but money is all they have. Wow. So, so I believe there are eight forms of wealth and economic wealth is only one. And and the model for that, the eight forms of wealth is in the everyday hero manifesto, but I'll give you one example. Family, my partner, her grandma just turned nine, turned 90 a little while ago. Mm. So at the birthday party, I, found some time with her one-on-one. I said, what's most important to a great life? And she looked at me, she said, family. Yeah. So there are many forms of wealth. There are a lot of people who have tons of money, but that brings tons of complexity. Mm -hmm. And so they actually are trapped in by their wealth. So why do they come to me? Because they they have everything, all the material things in the world, but they've lost themselves. They feel like imposters. Often they don't know their kids often they, they, they've reached the mountaintop, but then they say like, where do I go next? Some of them come to me because they want to make more money. Mm. Um, sometimes they come to me because they have health issues. They've built this great empire, but they've lost their health along the way. Someone once said to me, health is the crown on the well person's head that only the ill person can see. So for anyone who thinks, oh, if I made a lot of money, that would be the solution to my problems. I think of John Kabat-Zinn, the great Zen master. And he said, wherever you go, there you are. Mm. So when are you coming to Dubai? Because wherever you go is where you are. Are you coming here? I was in Dubai for an, for a great event in November. You were? And I, I was. I had an amazing, I love Dubai. I, I, I love my, 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 my readers there. I love the sunshine. I love the culture. I love the food. Um, and I'm booked. I'm booked for an event in Dubai. Uh, I, think in, I think it's in, possibly in October. Well, then you're going to have to come into the studio and speak to us and we'll see what's going on with you in October. I would love to. And I have to give you credit where it's due. You're, you're one of the best interviews I've talked. One of the best interviewers I've been blessed to talk to in ages. And it just made it fun for me. So I want to thank you very much for that. That's just given me goose pimples. The goose, I was like shivers. That's such a, an amazing compliment. Thank you so much, Robin. If ever you need a sidekick, 
for your events, I'll be there for you. <laughs> okay, I'll be looking forward to it, and uh, ho hopefully, I'll get a, I'll get a copy of your book. It's it's called the Eight AM Club, right? Yeah, it's I called. It's I can't called, wait to read it. Yeah, but I will only start writing about nine because eight AM is when I'm having my get up and have my breakfast. Nine AM is when I about start life. Yep. Okay, so so now we're talking about the nine AM club. Yeah, like you keep on getting up an hour later every time, every five minutes. So I, what's I, the sequel going to be? I think, Robin, this book's going to be about a chapter. That's about it, really. Okay. Well, really it's going to be short read. It's going to be a short read, so it'll be cheap on the shelves. And in Amazon, you'll, you'll probably get it for about $2. So I think it will be a hit, really, with that kind of price. Okay. I'll be looking forward to it. Don't worry. I'll send you a signed copy and say, it's 5 a.m. Get up. That will be my message okay. for you. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. I appreciate it. I appreciate the generosity of spirit and um, basically disrupting my whole 5 a.m. club method in for, for the sake of your 9 a.m. club book. But that's okay. We can still be friends. And we've got it on live on radio. He will not sue me for this. It's not a copy of the 5 a.m. club. <laughs> Not but my, it's not in my nature. It's not in my nature. And I'm not a lawyer anymore. So. Oh, yeah. I'm dealing with an ex-lawyer. I've got to be really careful. Okay. Okay. Robin, it has been a pleasure. I'm going to let you carry on with your holiday uh, in South Africa. And please do let me know when you're back here. I'd love to get you in the studio. It'd be a pleasure. And, and uh, to all my readers in Dubai and beyond, thank you so much. And Poonam, again, um, thanks for such a fun time. I really enjoyed mm. it. Thank you. I love you. <laughs> See you later. Take care. Bye.